I'm going to ask you all to do a weird thing. Okay, so let's straighten your seat, both feet on the floor. Now, I want you to pretend that your left leg is suddenly paralyzed. You can't move it. Try to wiggle your toes. It doesn't work. Move your leg around. It's not listening. You can't move your leg. Okay, your left leg is paralyzed. Your right leg, on the other hand, is normal. So feel that it's normal now. Lean into it. Move it around. Wiggle your toes. Feels okay. So left leg paralyzed, right leg normal. Now what I want you to do is lift up your right knee, high as you can, off the floor. I can hear it happening. How many of you realize that your left foot is now pushing into the ground? Just a little bit. Show your hands. What you are witnessing is your body's automatic motor control programs that are happening outside of your conscious control. Our nervous system is like a computer. It's made of hardware, our brain, our nerves, our spinal cord, but these would do nothing without software programs that run on them. Software controls our daily life. It controls our movement, our sensation, our cognition, our memory, our personality, our sleep. All of it's controlled by software. Think about how difficult it would be for you to walk down the street that's busy during rush hour with a friend having a coffee. If you had to consciously think about every single step that you were taking, every sip of your coffee, every person coming towards you on the sidewalk and you had to swerve to miss them, if that was all happening consciously. Human beings evolved to live in complex environments by automating these programs so we could free up our brain resources to focus on what is most important at that moment. So when something goes wrong in the system, this can happen in one of two ways. Say weakness, for example. Something can be broken in the structure of the body or the software programs can become glitchy or sometimes go offline completely. And so our healthcare system is set up to treat the body, the structure. Doctors are trained to look for patterns of known diseases by doing careful histories, physical examinations, and diagnostic tests. And if these all come together in a pattern that we recognize, we diagnose a disease. Structural disease shows up on blood tests, on x-rays, on MRIs, and on CT scans. Medical training is learning pattern recognition for structural disease. But from the patient's perspective, they don't feel a disease. They feel a symptom in the body that tells them that something is wrong. And the problem is not symptoms don't always align with what we see or don't see on a test. And that's because the symptom experience is a combination of the damage done to the structure plus the brain's interpretation of that damage. Structure plus the software. To make matters more complicated, you can have a spectrum of contribution of each of these things. So you can have a very large contribution of the structure, say, for example, a brain tumor, and only a small contribution of the software. Or you can have a very large contribution of the software, say, for example, a migraine, and hardly any contribution of the structure. The point is the software can modify the symptom experience. And as a neuroscientist, for me, this is where the magic happens. So I started studying this 20 years ago, doing my PhD on the placebo effect. I was fascinated by the idea that just because somebody thought they could get better, they felt better. Could our symptoms, could our minds change our bodies? I work with patients with Parkinson's disease, and I gave them a placebo and told them that it was a medication, and then I measured their brain responses using PET scans. And what I discovered was pretty cool. When someone expected to get better, their brain responded as if it was on medication, but they had been given a placebo. And when we examined them, their symptoms were better too. I had a gentleman who had to be wheeled into the scanning room in a wheelchair in the morning when he was off medication. And when the study was done, he was able to, when he thought that he was on medication, he was able to get off the scanning bed, walk down a long hall, up a flight of stairs, but he had been given placebo. What I learned is that people feel better 
based on their strength of belief of improvement. The mind, their conscious thoughts, were able to alter their brain neurochemistry and also their symptom experience. So I saw firsthand that the brain and mind and body are not separate things. So I finished my PhD, I went to medical school, and I specialized in neurology. I treat diseases that affect the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. And over the last 10 years practicing as a neurologist, I have seen how dualistic our healthcare system tends to be. We are very good at separating the mind from the body. In fact, the mind was completely physically segregated out of the body when patients with mental illness were taken out of hospitals and put into asylums. And still now, the stigma persists. If a patient presents with symptoms that don't align with a test or a pattern that we recognize, our strong belief in the dominance of structure over function leads us to the only logical but false conclusion that the symptoms can't be real. The patient must be making them up. We tell them, well, the good news is you don't have anything dangerous or nothing is wrong or your symptoms are very real to you. Or worst of all, it's all in your head. The patient understandably feels invalidated, not believed, maybe ashamed or embarrassed. They lose trust in their doctor. Maybe they go see another doctor. They gradually lose trust in the healthcare system and the cycle perpetuates. It's an entirely unhelpful and untherapeutic interaction. But there is a problem. The problem is in the software. An infinite number of factors contribute to the software programs in our brains. The genes we inherited, the childhood we grew up with, all of our life experiences all come together to produce the unique individual that is you. And given this complexity, it makes sense that things can go wrong in the system. And when they do, they can break in predictable ways. The problem is, because this is happening in the space between the brain, the mind, and the body, we, the doctors, and the healthcare system, we can't see it. We don't recognize it. But it's in this space that the art of medicine happens. And in this space lies enormous potential for innovation. Just like we can learn to see patterns in the structure, we can also learn to see patterns in the space things that keep coming up again and again and again, things that can be targeted and treated. If we can integrate the brain, the mind, and the body and stop pretending like they're separate things, we can open up new avenues for treatment, better patient experiences, more efficient health systems, and more provider satisfaction. Healthcare becomes healing. The whole patient, the whole person is seen. So how? How do we do this? How do we learn to see patterns in this gray, more human space? Well, we have to change how we look at the problem. And to do this, we need two key things. The first is we need a model. We need a model where the dysfunction is happening in the software and not the structure. So that condition already exists. It's called functional neurological disorder, or FND. FND is guaranteed the most common neurological disease you've never heard of. People experience weakness, seizures, tremor, problems with walking because of corruptions in the software programs in their brains, and all the tests are normal. So you all experience something very similar to functional weakness at the beginning of this talk. Now, in that case, you were feigning weakness, but in FND, the problem is completely involuntary and unconscious because the problem is in the software. FND costs the healthcare system $1.2 billion a year, and it takes patients an average of six years to get the right diagnosis. It's a crisis for patients, for neurologists, and the healthcare system. Okay, so we have our model, we have FND. The second thing we need is a new perspective, an open mind. We have to be willing to go into the gray to see the problem in the gray. 
many different things lie outside of our human ability to perceive them. So last summer, my family started taking walks after dinner with UV flashlights. And look at what we could see. There is a whole world that we are missing because humans cannot see beyond the spectrum of visible light. It doesn't mean it's not there. We just need a different flashlight to see it. So in my clinic, I took a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a physiotherapist, all in the same room at the same time with the patient. We used a different flashlight to illuminate the patient's problems and come up, try to come up with creative strategies to treat them. So for example, we treated a 25-year-old woman with uncontrollable movements of her body and who was unable to walk. Through our program, we learned that she used to be a ballet dancer. She loved ballet. Ballet was a source of pride for her and genuine joy. And she had all these childhood and motor programs of ballet exercises in there, in the brain. We resurrected those programs and combined that with physiotherapy. And she relearned how to walk. We treated a 61-year-old man who had a disabling tremor in the right side of his body after a motor, motor vehicle accident. His tremor was very tied to his level of anxiety in the system. And so through combining anti-anxiety strategies like breathing, meditation, with physiotherapy, we were able to relearn smooth movements for basic functions, like drinking out of a glass. And even he was surprised. We also treated a 33-year-old man who every time he walked, his back would go into a hyperextended posture. And he had tried years of physiotherapy with no benefit. He was paying an excessive amount of attention to his body. So we taught his brain to shift, to shift the spotlight of that attention off of the body and onto other activities that he loved to do. And he was also able to relearn how to walk normally. I treated a 21-year-old woman who had uncontrollable, severe ballistic movements of her arms and her legs, so severe that she had to be in a wheelchair. She also had tried lots of therapy and it hadn't worked. We taught her to reset her nervous system and to regulate how activated it was through breathing, visualization, mindfulness practices. And she was able to walk and even run and even shuffle again, which you will see now. So over time, we learned to see new patterns and then develop new therapies that combined mental and physical health together. And over time, we found that people got better, they got better faster, and they stayed better for longer. We also learned that the greatest predictors of who was going to do well in therapy were things that aren't routinely tested on a, re on a regular medical visit. What stood out the most was readiness for change. People who did the best were truly ready for rehab. And we began assessing this up front in our patients. And what we found, very surprisingly, was only 40% of people at any given time were really ready to engage in rehab. But of those, over 90% got better. So ironically, the key to recovery kind of was all in their head. But we couldn't see it until we changed our perspective, our perspective. Why this isn't commonplace across the, across the healthcare system is complex and multifaceted. Our healthcare system is still very much structured in silos, and providers are uncomfortable kind of straying too far outside of their own scope of practice. We overvalue technology and tests, and we undervalue human relationships. Things like medication and simple interventions are a lot easier to study in randomized clinical trials than more complex interventions like this kind of work. The stigma about mental health that is so prevalent in our society extends and is built into how our healthcare system is structured, and we teach our, our patients this dualism. And this also takes more time than doctors have. 
but I can tell you, it's the most rewarding and most efficient way to practice medicine. And now I can never go back. My vision for healthcare of the future is to build systems that are healing instead of treating. Disease, disease doesn't happen on a blank slate. It happens in an individual, a person, with a lifetime of experiences, values, beliefs, and expectations that all together combine to inform how that person will, will live and adapt to life with their illness. Let's turn it's all in your head into a call to action, an opportunity for us to do better, to remove the stigma and combine mental and physical health together to see and do medicine differently. I propose we stop doing treatments to people and instead work with them to develop creative solutions that address both mental and physical health. Innovation in healthcare doesn't have to be expensive and doesn't have to rely on fancy technology. All we need is time, an open mind, and a new flashlight. Thank you. <laughs>